Aloha and welcome to our video on ocean productivity. In here we'll list the factors that influence a region's photosynthetic productivity, but also we'll describe oceanic feeding relationships. Okay, so let's look at productivity by location. And when we're in productivity here, we're talking photosynthetic productivity. The first place we're gonna go is here to the tropics. And in the tropics, what we notice is we have this warm nutrient depleted surface water. There's this thermocline that we talked about, this temperature gradient, and then we have this cool nutrient rich water below. Now notice we have this nutrient rich water down here, but it's blocked by this thermocline from getting up to the surface. So we don't get a lot of productivity in the tropics because the nutrients are already been depleted. So even though there's a lot of sun and we would expect to have a lot of photosynthesis, there's not those nutrients that, that phytoplankton needs for photosynthesis to occur. So we don't see a lot of it happening there. Now, if we go up to the temperate ocean regions, and this is gonna be just outside of the tropics and up north a little ways, what we notice is we have a couple spikes in productivity. We're gonna have one here in the spring, and then we'll have one here in the fall. The one in the spring occurs because as winter comes and there's less sunlight in the temperate regions, the nutrients are going to be allowed to build up a little bit. Because there's less sunshine, and we can see there's less sunshine here, that's going to cause photosynthesis to go down. And if there's no photosynthesis going on, there's no phytoplankton, the zooplankton have nothing to eat. So there's not a lot of biological activity in the wintertime. But what we do see is a charging of the water with these nutrients. As the sun comes back in the springtime, we notice a spike in phytoplankton, which is gonna rise up here, and then we followed by a spike in this zooplankton. We'll peak out here, and what happens is, is the nutrients start to deplete, so that causes the phytoplankton to drop down. The nutrients are down here, and then we have this zooplanktonic curve that catches up, and that's what we see over the summertime. So in the spring, we see an awful lot of productivity, in the summertime, everything kind of balances out from that one. And then in the fall, we see a little bit of nutrient rise. We're going to see a little spike in the phytoplankton. It's going to cause a little bump in the zooplankton. And then basically the whole level would crash, except as the sunlight comes down to a certain point, that's where we see the crash of photosynthesis. That's going to cause the crash of those animals that are feeding on those and we start seeing this winter buildup of nutrients again. So that's how that cycle is going to continue. Now, when we're looking at these feeding relationships, one of the interesting things to notice is, and you should remember this from biology class, that remember that not all the energy is able to transfer from one trophic level to the other. Remember, trophic is just energy levels. So here, we're going to build our little pyramid here, and we're going to make our pyramid going to be five layers. Okay, so we have three, four, and five. So our first trophic layer is that, that takes the energy from the sun. So here we have a half a million units of energy from the sun coming through, and only about 10,000 of that units is going to be converted to energy by this first one, which is going to be our phytoplankton. So through photosynthesis, we're only trapping about 10,000 units of radiant energy. So here, our trophic level one is where we're going to find our phytoplankton. Okay, and this is what's taking energy from the sun. Now our phytoplankton is then going to be fed on by zooplankton, and we're going to see a transfer of about a thousand units. And remember, it's about 10% is going to transfer over. So our trophic level two is going to be made up of zooplankton. Okay, and these feed on the phytoplankton. From there, we're going to see a hundred units transfer up to level three. And that'll be our third trophic level. And this is just going to be, let's call it just a small fish. Okay. And that'll take us up to our next trophic level where we have 10% again going through. So that's only 10 units are going to transfer to that one. And here we'll have our big fish. And then finally we get to the apex of our pyramid. And here we're going to use us. We'll use humans. And notice only one energy. So we're seeing half a million units of energy received only 10,000 of it gets converted into this energy pyramid through phytoplankton. And every step we take, we're going to lose 10% of that. 10%, 90% is going to go into living and reproduction and things are there. Only 10% gets moved on. 
So for a half a million units of energy, we as humans are only going to be able to get about one unit. So you can see how it depletes as we go through. Okay, the last topic we wanted to talk about are food chains and webs. And again, this is a review from biology class. But notice that we're going to start off with our photosynthetic organisms down here. And our photosynthetic organisms will then be consumed by a primary producer. So we'll take the nice simple one. We'll use a copepod right here. And then our copepod is going to be fed on by a secondary consumer. And that would be our North Sea herring. So a food chain shows us a very simple path of energy by consumption of what's going on. So we start off with our photosynthetic organisms, our producers, and then we have our consumers moving up. In the ocean, it doesn't work that way, though. In the ocean, these photosynthetic organisms are going to be fed on by some zooplanktons. They're going to be fed on by some tunicates, some mollusk larvae, some clitocerians. Those, in turn, are going to be fed on by other organisms like amphipods and then up to the North Sea herring, which is going to be our apex predator in this example. So you can see a food chain is going to be a straight shot from one organism to another, hence chain looks like that. And then we link all of these together, we end up with a food web that looks something like this one here. Okay, so that's it for this video. As always, good luck on your quiz, and we'll see you in the next video.